heart being the center place of our will, our emotions, and our actions. He's saying that your heart is your innermost being. It is really what makes you tick. It's what makes you make decisions. It's what gives you passions uh, about what it is that you're doing or what it is that you're not doing. Your heart that God is talking about throughout the Bible is not the beating organ inside of you. Your heart is actually who you are as a person, what drives how you think, how you live, and how you act. So as we walk and deal with this issue of the physical heart and the spiritual heart, they're not the same thing. But I do want to kind of set up and share with you something tonight as we deal with the spiritual heart as it relates to the physical heart. If you were to do careful research in the world of sports history, whether that's football or basketball, one of the things that we have seen is that professional athletes are individuals who we expect for their hearts to be healthy. We expect for professional athletes' hearts to be healthy because of the level of participation in the activities of the sport that they're involved in and how they have to exert themselves. And therefore, we believe that their cardiovascular system, and especially that heart organ, the one that pumps the blood, ought to be healthy. But yet, sometimes we can find out in superior athletes that there's just a little something wrong with the heart, and that little bit wrong with the heart can cause that athlete to cease to exist. There was an athlete who was a running back for then USC Trojans by the name of Ricky Bell. Some of you may not remember Ricky Bell, but he wore number 42 for the USC Trojans, was drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, was an all Pac-10 running back, all American, drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And yet while experiencing a very successful career, we come to find out that there was a little something wrong with Ricky Bell's heart. And this all pro athlete now playing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, life was cut short because there was something wrong inside his heart. Now, from the outside, he looked okay. He looked all right. But something was wrong with his heart, and his life was cut short. But he ran all the time. He was around football all the time. But his heart muscle, something on the inside, just wasn't right. Then there was an athlete in basketball by the name of Hank Gathers, played for Loyola Marymount, was leading the NC2A left-hander, was leading the NC2A in scoring and rebounding, was a all-American athlete with this team, Loyola Marymount, and while running up and down the court after having just dunked the basketball, gets to midcourt, passes out, and dies on the court. But yet, superior athlete, all-American, leading the NC2A in scoring and in rebound, but yet there was something wrong with his heart on the inside, and he ends up dead on the court. There was a young man by the name of Reggie Lewis who played for the Boston Celtics who was coming behind Larry Bird in that generation of Boston Celtics, and he was the star player that was replacing and now the new captain of the Boston Celtics, six foot eight, about 195 pounds, and was responsible for uh, holding Michael Jordan whenever the Celtics played uh, the Chicago Bulls. And he moved to where, throughout his career, the young man had become an all-star. Every year he was going to be on the all-star team, and yet he looked like he was in shape the exact same way Hank Gathers looked like he was in shape, the exact same way Ricky Bell looked like he was in shape, and yet there was something wrong with his heart, and he fell to his death, and he died. Now, here are people that are around the sport, and it looks like they're healthy, but there's something wrong with their heart, and they're dying. Now, understand there was a moment of death, but the whole time they had been sick. There was a moment of death, but the whole time they had been sick. 
but they're around the sport. They appear to be healthy, but they have been sick the whole time. I'm afraid that there's some Christians that are around Bible study, that are around church, that are around praise and worship, that are around prayer, and our hearts might be sicker than we actually think. And so I want us tonight to walk through the Word of God, and by the end of this time of study in the Scripture, I want you to find out if you want to continue to say that people have good hearts. Because I want to allow God to do His work at opening up and diagnosing the heart of man. And I'm not talking about the organ beating. I'm talking about the inner man, what the Bible describes as the seat of your will, actions, and emotions. And it will now begin to allow you and I to have insight on ourselves in the past, potentially insight on us in the present, but it will also allow us to have insight on those that we interact around us. Amen? In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, if you'll give me the slide, please. Notice this. The scripture says, guard your heart with all diligence. It will determine the course of your life. Now, notice what the proverb writer Solomon, the wisdom writer, says. Listen very carefully. He said, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the course or the direction of your life. What God actually is saying through the wisdom writer is play defense against yourself. It does not make any sense in the sports world for you to have the ball on offense trying to score and make progress, but yet you're defending yourself. God says the number one person that you need to be checking is not somebody else, but check yourself. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it will flow the course and the direction of your life. In other words, the person that you need to be checking on the most is not somebody else or your neighbor, but you need to be checking yourself. In other words, if you were playing basketball, you need to be dribbling and d yourself up at the exact same time. Because as you dribble and go in a direction, you might need to defend yourself and say, don't go that direction. Because that's, that's the wrong direction. So while you are so-called making progress, you got to, at the moment you make progress, make sure that your defense is defending you the right way and you're going in the right direction. God says, guard your heart. And when he says, guard your heart, he says, don't be lazy about it. Be diligent about it. Make sure that you don't take lightly the condition of your heart because from it determines the course of your life. Now, notice this is that when you deal with yourself and I deal with myself, there's something that's going on in the inside of us to where we think about things, we contemplate things, and before we ever do things, we have rehearsed it in our minds, in our innermost being, in here, that nobody knows about out there, and the decisions that we make come from in here. He says, guard your heart. Make sure that while you're thinking about what you're thinking about with the so-called mind of Christ, before we get to your heart, your innermost being, that you're thinking the right way. He's saying you got to check yourself because if you don't check yourself, watch this, no one else controls your life but you. You, you, you better watch this text. Guard your heart with all diligence. It will determine the course of your life. Can, can I tell you something? Nobody messed you up as bad as you think that they messed you up. I'm not saying that people didn't do bad things to you. I'm not saying that real things didn't happen to you. But the reality is, is in the midst of what has happened to you, you have not thought about what God has done for you. When your concentration level is more on what happened to you versus how God delivered you from what happened to you, you got a concentration on the wrong thing. And let me suggest, you ain't playing good defense against yourself yet. Anytime you think more about the troubling circumstance from 15 years ago versus realizing that you got new undeserved mercies for the last 15 years, 
and you're concentrating on what somebody did to you 15 years ago, but yet you don't realize what you've done to yourself the last 15 years. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the course of your life. In other words, if you really want to evaluate your life, don't blame anybody else but yourself. Check your heart. Check your will. Check your decisions. Check your emotions. The proverb writer is saying, if you want to be a wise person, you need to guard your heart. Now, let's go deal with this word heart. Next slide, if you don't mind. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The very first time the word, gen the word heart is mentioned, the word heart is mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It's the very first time. Now, notice what God says. It is in the situation of the flood. And in Genesis 6, verse 5, right before the flood, the Bible says in verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now watch the verse. Check out verse 5. I'm going to read it one more time. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his mind was on evil continually. Does it say mind? No, it says heart. It says his heart. In other words, the heart is the seat of your will, your emotions, and your decisions. It's not the physical beating organ. So he says that God then saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Now, the word then introduces us to something called a concept of something happened in time prior to the then. If you go back to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the Bible says that man was looking at women, and he saw that the daughters of men were sexy and voluptuous, had hips, lips, and fingertips, and as a result, man was trying to take for himself as many wives as he could, and he was no longer living his life based on Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24 says that the two became one flesh, that God has ordained in marriage for one man to marry one woman. That's God's program. That's his perfect plan. But now men are no longer choosing women based on their spirituality. They're now choosing women based on their sensuality and their sexuality. So men's decisions about women were totally being made off of hips, lips, and fingertips. The Bible says when men saw that the daughters of men looked good, in other words, it had nothing to do about your insides. It was my eyesight uh, observing your outside, and as a result, I made a decision about you. So what was moving the man's heart was, I like the way she looks. I need some of that right there. I don't care if she knows Jesus or if she don't know him. And here's the deal. I'll take as many of them will have me as they want. Then God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Check out verse 5. The wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Now notice the very first time that God mentions that man's heart has a condition. Watch this. God's initial diagnosis of our hearts is that they are evil. The very first time God talks about your innermost being who you and I are as people in the Bible, he says you're evil. Yeah. Oh, they really good kids. They, no, the Bible don't say that. My, my, my children are really good. All right, let's keep on to Genesis 8 verse 21. Now notice what he said is that their hearts were on evil continually. Now parents, you need to read your Bible like never before. You can wake up right now. Now's a good time to wake up. Genesis 8 21. Because you thought you had a good kid. Yeah. Genesis 8, 21, watch the Bible. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. This is right after the flood. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his what? Now, did you catch that? Yeah. The intentions of man's heart are evil from their youth. 
The first time the word youth, and you know I used to be a youth pastor, the first time the word youth is ever used in the Bible, the word youth is connected to an evil heart. Now, you think your kid is good? You, you, Blake, yes, Mom. Dad and I are going to Dallas this weekend. Dad's calling SMU versus UT in Texas Stadium. Eric Dickerson, Craig James, and the boys against the horns. Blake, don't let nobody in this house. No problem, Mom. Love y'all. Have a good trip. See you when you get back. Phone call. Hey, sis, house is open. Heart is evil, and the intentions of the heart are evil from the youth up. Don't you ever get it twisted to begin to think that when God himself diagnoses the hearts of people, that he thinks that we're good folk. Now, now, now look here. I ain't waiting on no amens in advance. I want to give you a realistic diagnosis of what God says about the heart of man and why you're going to be so blessed that God changed your heart. Because here's the deal. If you are walking out of here tonight and you feel pressure in your left arm and you get lightheaded and fall out and somebody comes and takes you to the hospital and you make it and they say, man, he got three arteries clogged up. Now, you didn't know that you had three arteries clogged up. If you would have known that, you would have looked inside of yourself and said, hey, man, it looks like this first one is getting clogged up. You, you, you know what, man? I think the second one is getting, I better quit eating that, that piggly wiggly. I got to get off that fried food. You know what? The second one is clogged. Look, look the third one. If you would have known it, you would have changed something, right? People don't recognize that their heart is jacked up. So if somebody ends up passing, you get them to the hospital, and they say, oh, man, thank you. Y'all, what's the diagnosis? Man, you got three clogged arteries. We're going to have to go in there and open that thing up and perform major surgery on you if you're going to live right. Now, if not, you can go back, and we don't perform any surgery on you, and you can die today. Who's volunteering for that? Ain't nobody volunteering for that. So here's the deal. If you don't get a proper diagnosis of your innermost being, of what God thinks about you and I, left away from Jesus, you're going to miss this thing. And you're not going to diagnose people properly and or deal with people properly. And here's the big issue, is that you're going to be walking around tomorrow, somebody hurt me. Yo, they ain't no good in the first place. So if somebody hurt you, why are you concerned and so messed up when God told you the person that hurt you was evil in the first place? Yeah. See, it would now let you know who you're dealing with. And guess what? Now I recognize who hurt me is evil. I got to deal with my own heart so that I don't get caught up in their evil and their evil totally consume me to where now I'm messed up even more than I am all by myself. Yeah. Now, let's, let, let's check this out. Genesis 6 verse 5. While we were in 821, he says, 6 5, he says that the intentions of man's heart are on evil continually. That man did not have a natural propensity to think good things. Man does not have a natural propensity to think good things. Now, watch this. When, before Adam and Eve sinned, Adam and Eve were naked. Is that in the Bible? Would you agree? They didn't have any problem with nakedness before they sinned. No issue. Adam and Eve sinned, and the Bible says, and now they knew that they were naked, and they clothed themselves. They're the only two people on the face of the earth. So why you got to clothe yourself? A few minutes ago, you were naked, and you were fine with it. Now you're naked, and you're not fine with it. What happened? Now I'm projecting evil into what God has created as good, because of my mind and my heart has now been changed. See, sin messed us up so much is that you no longer see people as good. You see people as bad. You project faults into what you see. See, because right now, ain't nobody coming in church naked on Sunday morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready, man, you know, and, and just walk up in here. Bible said, no, we're we putting on some clothes. Now, this ain't just because you ain't had no six-pack. You know, everybody is put on clothes. Why? Because we want to cover ourselves. Now, we want to hide something. The Bible says we long to be clothed. Romans tells us that. But why is that? Because 
we couldn't handle seeing each other naked, but Adam and Eve could when they were created in their original state. Because if you see me naked, I see you naked, we now project things into what we see. Why? Because our heart's messed up. You, 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 better, you better project this thing. So now men see women, and men don't say, my sister in Christ. God bless you. Men say, what you think? God? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Why? Because man's heart has changed. No longer seeing a sister first as spiritual, but seeing her now first as sexual. Now, remember this verse right here because we're going to deal with it at the very end of the Bible study in the New Testament. So God's initial diagnosis of our hearts is that our hearts are evil. Our innermost being, what we think about, our will, our emotions, our decision-making process that normally left to the natural self is evil all by itself. Next slide. Turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah the prophet is going to speak concerning man's heart. Remember that as we're talking about the heart, we're not talking about the physical beating organ, but the innermost being of the person, the reality of who you are. Watch what Jeremiah says from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Cursed is the man who places their trust in mankind and makes flesh his strength. That when you lift up a human being or a man on a pedestal or a woman on a pedestal, he said that person is cursed. Y'all, I don't need a man, it's in the book. When you begin to exalt people on an altar in your heart and place them on a throne that, you have, that they have never designed to be on, the Bible says you're cursed. Because you have so misfocused on man that you've, made, you've placed man in a position that only God was supposed to be in. Watch this Bible now. In verse 5 says this, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Did you catch it? See, your heart turned away from the Lord because you placed man above the Lord. You placed man as your sufficiency. You placed man as your satisfaction. You placed man as your source. And as a result, you put so much confidence in a person that you turned away from God himself from being all that he is. God is no longer your soul satisfier. God is no longer your sole source. You need a man to do that. You need your wife to do that. You need your woman to do that. So he says, you have turned away from God when you have exalted a human being and placed your trust in him. Oh, if, if they can only complete me. God says, you cursed. You are cursed. Now notice this. When you place your heart on the wrong person versus on God, he said that person is living under the curse. But he's not finished yet. So you got to make sure that life is not total satisfaction found in a human being that so-called completes you. Because if a human being so-called completes you, although it was a great line in a movie, you have forgot Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says that you have been made complete in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2 8 says, you've been made complete. So if you think that somebody else completes you, that means that you're a half. And if the person that completes you is full and incomplete in Christ, and you marry them or you date them, you just brought them down. Why? Because you're a half because you're incomplete without them, and so I need you to complete me. And if e even if they're whole, but they think you're fine enough to date, although you ain't whole, and you're a half, and they date you, one times a half is a half. Now watch this. If they need you to complete them too, and you, they, and you need them to complete you, and he's a half and she's a half, y'all are now a fourth. You just diminished yourself by getting together. Anytime you don't get together with somebody that's complete in Christ, you always diminish yourself. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, 
This is critical because he's saying anytime you put a human being on the throne and exalt them and place them in a position that only is reserved for God, you sick. You cursed. Now, watch it. Your heart turns from God. No, no, no. I, I just really like them, God. I thank you for giving them to No, 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 no. You don't thank me for giving. You, you actually reject me. Because you put more confidence in them than you do me. Watch this. He ain't finished. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Now, I want to say it like this one more time. You know, they got a good heart. You know, you, you, man, that's my cousin. She got a good heart. He got a good heart. Now, y'all, I just want to read a little Bible to you. Let's read a little Bible. Je 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 Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Let me stop right here. Y'all, the Bible says that the devil, Revelation 12, 9, is the deceiver of all mankind. The deceiver of the world, the devil is. Next to the devil is your heart. K k listen to me very carefully right here. The heart is more deceitful than all else. In other words, your innermost being will deceive you so much that you don't realize you lied to yourself. Y'all, you, you, you better check this innermost being and why you need your heart to change. Has anybody been dating somebody and you knew that they weren't no good? Now, now come on, Holy Ghost. You, you knew your mama said, I don't like them. They, they, they people ain't no good. And yet, anyhow, you decided with your own mind, they don't know nothing. They just jealous of me. Okay, now after you done got ruined, and now you crying on mama, but mama didn't know nothing nine months ago, but her shoulder's good right now for some tears. Why? Because your heart deceived you and lied to you. You, you want, no, uh, keep me, Lord. Yo, God says you can't trust yourself. You, but before you make any decisions, you better guard your heart. Why? Because you'll deceive yourself. And watch this. Believe a full-fledged lie and be rooted that it's the truth. Watch this. And curse out good folk who love you enough to tell you, baby, you're going the wrong way. Shoot. Now you don't have a family reunion meeting against the person that said, baby, that's the wrong way. Why? Because you can't trust your own heart. Yo, this ain't dealing with nobody else. This is dealing with us. So he said, you don't even have the ability to make good decisions. Why? Because you lie to yourself and call your lie to truth and stand on it. Can I read this Bible? Here it is. Let's read it. Verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Now watch this. Not only is it deceitful, but it's not sick. It's desperately sick. Y'all, yeah. <laughs> it, it ain't just sick. It is desperately, y'all, it is on deep, beep, beep. Yo, it, it ain't even a consistent beep, beep, beep. It ain't, y'all, listen to me very carefully. You ought to be thankful when your way was wrong and God by his spirit shows you that the way that you were thinking and the way that you were willing and the decisions that you were making were wrong and God allows you by his spirit to turn away. Why? Because God is saying, I don't want you to lie to yourself and hurt yourself, so I'll change you. Because you can't change you. Now, watch him. He says the heart is desperately sick. Now, not only is it deceitful, will lie to yourself. So when it's deceitful, you, you know, you got to present yourself. Folk have to know you. And your reputation and your, your aura has to be right. And so you'll lie to yourself, create an aura that's false, believe the aura, but you ain't nobody. Now, y'all, you don't like anybody to lie to you. Now, if you really think about it, when you find out that somebody lied to you, then you get holy. Oh, no. You get a belt. You ready to get somebody when somebody lied to you. 
When somebody deceives you, now, nah, nah, you, you know, you I mean you talking to your wife, now nah, I'm gonna get him right now. You, you're gonna, but he said, you're the number one liar to yourself. Spank yourself. Get your belt out on you. How many of you have whipped you after that boy that left you? You, you I didn't catch that. You know you weren't supposed to date that boy. That's why you hurt. That's why you lost your virginity. I, that's why a whole lot of things, I'll just put it like that. And yet, you don't go spank yourself. I'm, I'm just mad at, at me. Oh, mama, don't, you know. You, you don't do that. You, you don't do that. Why? Because so deceived that you thought you were right. And it takes somebody almost killing you to make you live. He says, this heart man is desperately sick. Now watch this. He ain't finished with it. Who can understand it? Who, who can understand it? Inferring that you can't even understand yourself. Y'all, how can 50 people see? It's going to probably be wise, baby, if you leave him. Now, now let me tell you why. Baby, he been sleeping with you for 13 years and they married you. Now, now, baby, I don't think that he is that committed to you. Now, he likes sex and orgasm, but, you know, he ain't finna marry you. No, no, no. W one day he got me. Okay, all right. Now she's 59. Dentures, teeth falling out, still single. What happened to old boy? Well, you know, uh, about two years ago, after 25 years of being with him, he left me. Heart, desperately sick. Heart is deceived. Who can understand it? You can't even understand what you do. Watch this. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now check out this verse 10. Remember I said that your heart determines the course of your life, as the, as the God said? Watch what God says in verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. So while you are being deceived by your heart, I search your heart while you're making the decision. I recognize you just made a bad decision. I, I was searching it the whole time. I tested your mind. All the information came to you, and yet you still made the same decision. And watch this. Check it out. Verse, verse 10. Even to give to each man according to his ways. So I will give you what you want. The decisions that you make, I will give them to you. I searched your heart. You were making decisions. So the life that has been produced right now is your own production. You are your own production manager. No one else is writing your story. You've written your own film, and I will give you exactly what you want. Each man according to his ways and the result of his own deeds. So if my life is totally jacked up in some areas, I got to go back and check my heart. I got to go back to Proverbs 4.23 and guard my heart. Why? Because out of this gives the course of my life. The decisions that I make impact the course of my life. Now, Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, he says, well, that's where it is. Now, y'all, somebody would be like, dang, can, can, can we get some good news? No, we can't get any. <laughs> Turn with me to the next, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Next slide. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3, Solomon writes the Proverbs, the, the majority of them, as a young man. He writes Ecclesiastes chapter 9, well, the book of Ecclesiastes when he's an older man. And Solomon, with all the wisdom that God has given him, he's made good decisions and bad decisions his entire life. Solomon, the wisest man of all time, outside of Jesus, has made some great decisions at one moment and some horrible decisions the next moment. And Solomon begins to write this in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 3. Here's what he says. He says, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun. When I look down on earth, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the son of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. 
Y'all, here's God's spiritual prognosis, different than diagnosis. God's prognosis, in other words, here's how this thing going to end. Here's how it's going to end. His prognosis is that our hearts are full of evil and insanity. That at your best day, apart from God, you need to be wrapped up. At your best day, apart from God, you need to be in a straight jacket. God says, if I leave you to you and don't intervene with some heart surgery after this diagnosis and this prognosis, you're going to end up dead. Y'all, you, you, you're not really following me. Your heart is full of evil. Not only is it full of evil, it is insane. You are doing the same dumb things over and over and over again with no deliverance. And God says about you and I, is it you insane? Now, who's going to say after these little diagnoses and prognoses that you got a good heart? And you're trying to date somebody in this same condition. How are you? You insane. You evil. You desperately sick. You're deceived. And then you're going to date somebody deceived, desperately sick, evil, and full of insanity. How are you? That's why folk killing each other married. Y'all better get in this book. Now watch this. Then you got people that have salvation, and they have the mind of Christ, we talked about it last week, but not operating in the renewed mind that proves what the will of God is in day-to-day -day decisions, and so as a result, they live just like this, like they were non-believers, quiet, because they might be a believer spiritually, but functionally they're a non-believer, because they don't live according to the renewed mind. So if the believer doesn't put the mind of Christ to work, and turn it on, you'll live just like this. And your stuff isn't going to end up any better than anybody else's. That's why this heart and this mind thing is serious. When it comes down to changing an individual, God is saying, y'all, y'all ain't in good shape. Yeah. You know why you need Jesus right now? Because your mind from last week was depraved, hostile, and jacked up, and your heart ain't no better. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, can I put it like this? You got cancer of the mind, and you got, man, quadruple bypass is next. God says, man, you better be glad you're just alive. Yeah. You better be glad your heart physical is still beating. Because your spiritual man is dead, your spiritual mind is dead, and your heart is desperately sick and beyond cure. Yo, this is God telling the truth about our hearts. Now, your grandchild, oh, man, the best grandkid in the world, man. Your grandkids the best in the world. Now that's good, but do you know why the Bible says and that from childhood your children need to know the sacred writings that lead them to salvation? Because here's what happens. From childhood, your kid's heart is already hardened. Already hardened. So your kid is already at quadruple bypass spiritual state the moment they come out the womb. Already jacked up. So what God says is, what you need daily to do as the doctor, Robert Chance has uh, asthma, and so we'll call the doctor's office and the nurse, and they'll say, get this medicine and apply this to him and make him take these treatments on a day-to-day. -day. In other words, we got an answer, but you got to apply it. Yeah. You, be you better listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. So when you have a physical child, and the Bible accidentally says, purposely and accidentally says, that from childhood, your kid has known the sacred writings, which is able to give them wisdom, to lead them to salvation, to prepare them for every good work. It means you better prioritize your kid hearing the word of God. You, you better, why? Because if you don't prioritize your kid hearing the word of God, that hardened heart will become harder and harder and farther and farther away from a holy God. And you're wondering over Thanksgiving dinner, where's my son? And God is saying, I tested your heart. You never prioritized Bible study, but you prioritized football. You prioritize extracurricular activities, but you never made Bible study. Why? Well, they don't get no scholarship off the Bible. My kid can play. 
So now you'll compromise your kid's soul because you're not diligent in your finances to save nothing to pay for their college. Why? Because I tested your heart. It's desperately wicked and sick and it's beyond cure. And I gave you what you wanted. God being real with the folk. He says right here in Ecclesiastes 9.3, this is an evil that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. You're not going to escape this. There's one fate for all men. You ain't going to get missed. All, can I give you the Hebrew meaning? Yeah. All. <laughs> Hebrew language, let me break it down to you. All means all. That means 100% of all people going to be according to the scripture. All. That's, that's good, deep, deep Hebrew meaning. This is an evil and all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Now, y'all, did you catch that? It's not seasonal. Y'all didn't caught this thing. This insanity wasn't a seasonal deal. Yeah. It wasn't flu season and, and they called insanity. Now, they got insanity all the time. That means you got insane 62-year-olds. When the Lord doesn't move on a cat and his heart, he insane at 62. He's insane at 72. Man, you wonder why Big Mama jacked up. Now, she Big Mama, you know what I'm saying? But, but you wonder why Big Mama jacked up? Big Mama ain't got no heart change. Big Mama has no heart change. Went to church. No heart change. God says, man, y'all in bad shape. Hey, y'all, this is a lot of bad news, ain't it? It's a lot of bad news. Well, we got some good news now. We don't have none yet. Let's keep on going. Next slide. I'm just trying to tell you what's in the book. Proverbs 27, verse 9. Proverbs 27, verse 9. In Proverbs 27, 9, check this out. Ah. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. So a man's, excuse me, my bad, Proverbs 27, verse 19. That should be verse 19. My fault. As in water, face reflects face. So the heart of man reflects man. If you look down in the water, you're going to see yourself. It's going to reflect you. It's going to be a perfect reflection of who you are. So he says, when you look down in the water and the water is glimmering and all that, and you see yourself, it's a perfect reflection of who you are. Notice this, verse 19. So the heart of man reflects man. In other words, check this out. God's spiritual prognosis of our heart is they reveal our real identity. When God surveys your heart, it shows you and I who we really are. Yeah. Now watch this. It checks the motives of the heart, not just the actions of the hands. See, the actions of the hands are one thing. But why did you do what you did? The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and it goes down to the bone and the marrow and breathes in between and divides all the way through the heart. It gets down to the intentions of man's hearts. Now watch this. In other words, God says that when you look at a man's heart, it will give you the real reflection of who that man is. Your heart is the real reveal of your life. Not who we present, not, not any of that, but our innermost being that nobody sees or knows but God. We can fool everybody, but you can't fool God because he searches the heart. So here's the deal. Don't fool me. Don't fool the neighbor. Don't fool anybody else. Why? Because we're not the one that judge you. The one that you got to be real the most with and say, God, I need a heart surgery based on what you're showing me. 
Now, I, now I can do one or two ways to say, is somebody in here tonight saying, I hope next week is a better message. Because this sure is hard tonight. No, this is the best information that you can hear so that you can find out if you need a heart surgery. Or you can stay dead and end up there. Let's read it one more time, Proverbs 27, verse 19. As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. Think about today what was on your heart. What were in your thoughts? What were in your wills? What were in your emotions? What were decisions that you wanted to make? What decisions did you make? This is real talk. Because God is saying, that's who you are. That, 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 that's really who you are. So what God suggests to us is that there's a real battle going on in the mind, in the heart, in that inner place that nobody sees, but people see the outside. And here's God's deal. You take every thought captive to the knowledge and obedience of Christ, and you destroy all imaginations and speculations that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. In other words, your mind has to be so biblically prepared that when all thoughts and the flaming darts of the enemy toss into your mind, you have something to go and grab that thing down with and push it away. Other words, those thoughts will set up strongholds in your mind. And when it sets up a stronghold in your mind, it now becomes a behavioral pattern of addiction. Listen to me carefully. If you don't take thoughts captive, I'm in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, if you're wondering, that's what I'm quoting right now. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual for the tearing down of strongholds. In, in, in other words, if you allow things to pop into your mind, stay in your mind, and you don't battle them off with the word of God, that stuff will stay in your mind and have you on lockdown as long as you're going to be alive. You have to be involved as a Christian in active personal warfare against the flaming darts of the enemy that would control your entire mindset. Can I give you, give, give you a deal? You depressed? You know why? Because you think about depression. You, you, you know why you're depressed? Because when depression hits your mind and negative thoughts hit your mind, you allow them to stay. You forget to say, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, new mercies came today, and I'm going to bless your name. I will bless the Lord at all. Something bad just happened, but I'm going to start singing my song. But you allow stuff to stick and stay. You call somebody and talk about it. And now once you call somebody and talk about it, then watch this. It's more in there. It's more in there. You ain't prayed about it, but you talked about it. Yeah. Now watch this. You go to sleep on it. You didn't ask God to remove it. You didn't deal with it. You didn't take it captive. You haven't done nothing. And now it's a stronghold. Yeah. And watch this. Everything that you deal with in life is based on this stronghold. God says, I'm trying to change your heart. I'm trying to change your mind. Proverbs 27, 19, as in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. Next slide. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Romans 1, verse 21. As we travel from Old Testament to New Testament, the question is, is does the diagnosis get better? And if the diagnosis doesn't get better, that means we're in trouble. And watch Romans 1, 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They knew about God, but they didn't honor him as God. They didn't exalt God. They didn't hallow God. They didn't lift God up. They didn't make God who he really was. They didn't bless his name. Watch this. 
no music, no music. Can you hear yourself breathe? No music. Can you hear yourself breathe? If you can't hear yourself, do you feel yourself breathe? The Bible says you live, move, and have your existence and being because God gives you breath. Do you bless God just because you bleed? Because you breathe? Do you honor God because you walk? Do you honor God because you hear, smell, taste? Do you honor God? He says, although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give him any thanks. See, y'all, we, we sophisticated now. So because we're sophisticated folk, we don't pray, Lord, thank you for waking me up with a reasonable portion of my mind. Lord, we thank you for waking us up and starting us on our way. Oh, we, we don't give God no thanks. We get up and start wondering what we're going to wear, trying to decide and choose if we got on the right clothes. He says, they don't give God no thanks. As you drove today to the church, missed Rex, got here safely, for how many hundredth time in a row did you make it here with no wreck on the way? Did you give him thanks? You, you, you made it home? You slept last night? Nobody broke into your home. This morning I woke up and I heard on the news that a woman had to shoot and kill somebody as he tried to intrude the house. Told my sweet wife about it. She said, good for him. Y'all catch that about two weeks later. But yet, your house didn't get broken into last night. Slept all night? Woke, did you give him thanks? He said, although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God. Did God watch over you last night? Or, or, or did the alarm wake you up? Did they give him thanks? No, they didn't give him no thanks. So watch what happens. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. God says, you want to know what I think about your heart? It's darkened. Your heart was darkened. Why? Because you did not honor God as God. And the more and more you expunge the light, the more and the more the darkness of your heart shows off. The more and more you don't do the basics. The Bible says in 1, Timothy, 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks. In, in, in everything give thanks. Be careful when you eat a lot and don't pray a lot. Be, be careful when you eat and you forget to pray. Yeah. Be, be, be careful. Why? Because you ain't giving thanks. Yeah. Be careful when you go inside the house and you're no longer amazed and all you see in your house is a thing that needs to be renovated. When, when you go in your house and all you, you saw HGTV, so now your stuff needs to be upgraded, but somebody's sleeping outside. Be, be, be careful. Be real careful. So he says, their foolish hearts were darkened. The more and more you don't concentrate on the light of God and the love of God, your heart gets darkened. He ain't finished. Let's keep on going. Next slide. I wish he was done, but he's just not done yet, so I got to keep reading. Next slide. Here we go. Romans 125. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function. Excuse me, let me go to Romans 124. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Now notice this. Their bodies were full of lust and impurity. Their hearts were full of lust and impurity. So he says, here it is, Romans 124. I, I typed wrong. Romans 1, 24, their hearts are full of lust and impurity. That when God leaves you to yourself, your heart lusts after that which it was never designed to lust after. Notice that your heart is in a state of lust, not in a condition of love. In other words, your lust comes from an impure place. Love comes from a pure place. 
Lust comes from a selfish place. Love comes from a selfless place. He says, your hearts are full of lust and impurity. So because my heart is lustful selfishly, I want to go do impure things. I'm pleased by the impurity that comes from a dark heart, a lustful heart, and now I want to go engage in impure activities. That's what this heart does. That's where it leaves you. Keep on. Next slide. Now, let's go look at it. Matthew 15. What does this heart produce? Jesus in Matthew 15, I want you to listen to me. Jesus says in Matthew 15, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus says, these people honor me with their lips. Out of their mouth, they got a lot of praise. Out of their mouth, they got a lot of preaching. Out of their mouth, they got a lot of righteousness. But their heart, their innermost being is jacked up and is far from me. Remember, your heart, Jeremiah 17, turned from the Lord. He says, when I look at your heart, man, all your lip service, real good. Your heart truthfulness, no good. Matthew 15, verse 18. Check this out. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And these things defile the man. Now check out verse 19. And right next to verse 19, Genesis 6, verse 5, where it was originally stated that man's hearts and thoughts were on evil continually. So what was man thinking about? Jesus gives you the evidence. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. First thing, notice he doesn't say anything else. What man thinks about, what man concentrates on, is the very first thing that comes out of him. And from that thought process, watch, he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanderers, these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands did not defile the man. What Jesus just did in Matthew 15, verse 18 and 19 was told you what Hollywood thinks about. If you go over the last 20 years, there are really no movie in the top 10 is really just a good story. Why? We got to get some murder in it. Got to get some sex in there, some immorality. Got to get some fornication. Got to get some adultery. I mean, scandal wouldn't be scandal without adultery. It, it just wouldn't be. Empire just wouldn't be empire. Numbers done gone down from the church since empire came out. Wednesday night attendance across the country is hurting. Pastors calling each other. How y'all number look? Down, doc, down. Rev, how? Down, doc, down. All jacked up and hurt. Why? Because all this stuff promotes this. Now watch this. Thefts, adulteries. So you begin to look at Hollywood. You begin to look at what they be. He said, all this stuff comes from the heart. So the reason that Hollywood puts the movies out that satiate us, satisfy us, is because that's what's in their heart. They can't put out no good story. A good story is not in their heart. Do, do you understand? A good story is not in their heart. So this is what they, out of their hearts come first thing, evil thoughts. And from evil thoughts, we got to kill somebody. So, man, if you think about the movies that we've liked, I mean, like, I'm a good mob dude. I ain't ever watched a mob movie where a dude ain't got hit. Like Goodfellas, they're going to take somebody out. You know, I mean, Scarface, they, they, somebody got to die. You know, I mean, somebody got to go. Now, Gone in 60 Seconds, Ocean 12, Ocean 12, I mean, like high class stealing some stuff. Like, like, like that's the best stealing some stuff you've ever seen. Like, man, they got a good plan to break in that joint and steal that. Thefts, it comes from the heart. Yo, it's not accidental. 
So every time you and I watch a show, y'all, me and my wife watched this little show called Person of Interest, and I was catching up last night, and now I say, oh, Lord, I got to let it go. <laughs> you know, you know, you know I'm, I, I love Person of Interest. Me and my wife went and watched every season, but now we got the girl coming back, and I'm like, now hold up, y'all. This ain't even ABC. Or is it ABC? That's CBS. It's CBS. But I'm like, y'all, now we expect ABC to do that. But CBS, come on, man, hold something up for the Lord. No, 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 no. We got to get that little funny relationship going. Why? It's in our heart, man. It's in our heart. Now watch this. Because it's in Hollywood's heart to produce it, you and I eat it. See, I got to decide because I've got five or six person of interest taped. I got to episode three, and I said, oh, Lord. Now I got to decide if four, five, and six are worth it. Are, are, are you following me? But here's the deal. If I continue to eat, it's going to build up lust patterns in my old wicked heart to where now the next thing, I got some funny desires beyond the biblical desires. Oh, okay, it's just the pastor. So y'all ain't ever watched no movie with a scene and then go try to recreate the scene? I I'm going to leave that right there. I'm going to leave it right there. Matthew 15, verse 18. But the things that created out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, and false witnesses and slanders. Now, let me give you some good news. Next slide. Bless the Lord. Acts 16. Now that you realize that the heart is totally jacked up, and you're ready to say, my cousin sure has a good heart. Let me read Acts 16, 14 through 15, 20, and let me show you about this spiritual heart surgery that God performs. God calls the Apostle Paul in Acts 16 and gives him a vision. When he gives Paul a vision, the vision is not about building a building. When he gives him the vision, it says that we immediately concluded that God called us, Luke writing, to go preach the gospel to this man in Macedonia. So now Paul and his boys get up and they wake up and they begin to go to preach the gospel to Macedonia. And check out Acts 16 verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. Paul, Paul and them are preaching. Now watch this. The Bible says she's a worshiper of God. She has a general knowledge of God, but not a specific knowledge. Listen to me very carefully. She has a general knowledge of God. In Acts 10, the Bible will say Cornelius was a God-fearer. That means they have a general knowledge of God, but they don't have a specific knowledge of God. Now watch this. So watch what happens to this woman with a general knowledge. Now y'all, do you realize a general knowledge of God ain't getting you to heaven? If this scene right here does not go down, a person with a worshiper of God, general knowledge of God, is going to hell. Watch the Bible. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay with us. And he prevailed on them. Y'all didn't catch it. Watch this. Paul is preaching the gospel, and her heart is closed. So God now goes and works while the gospel is being preached, and God reaches inside of her and opens up her heart, which was closed to the gospel, he opens up her heart. In other words, God not only has Paul come preach to her, but then God 
initiates the action to open her up to respond. Meaning her heart that was desperately weak and evil and sick and everything that we've been reading about the last 45 minutes cannot be opened up unless God opens it up. Do do you understand what I'm saying? Y'all, you don't open your heart to know God. That ain't how it goes down. God initiates the opening of our hearts. When someone is preaching to us, God either moves in the unseen realm where you cannot see his hand, but moves inside of you and boom, regenerates you and allows you to respond. You don't choose God ever. God opens your heart to respond. All work in the gospel is initiated by God. Lydia is just a little worshiper of God, over there selling her little purple. God calls Paul. Lydia didn't know nothing about no Paul in in Acts 16. God sends Paul. Paul gets there. Paul speaks. Lydia has had her steps ordered by God because God has planned to have surgery on her that day. Do you remember the day that God opened up your heart to respond to the gospel? Do you remember that before the gospel came and you look back on your life and how rugged and wretched it was before the gospel came? And on that day, God came and boom, opened you up to respond to the gospel. If God doesn't open her up, there's no response on her part. God performs heart surgery. Here's the big news. The big news is God sins, God speaks, God saves. God sends somebody your way that you would never plan to meet. God speaks through the person or the vessel that he so chooses. And then God saves you by opening up your heart. Y'all, the last 45 minutes is a serious diagnosis of a totally wretched and jacked up heart that God has applied to every single one of us. This heart that he just talked about from Old Testament to New Testament, and I didn't even do Ephesians 4 where it says your heart was hardened. I didn't even do that one, but you can put it down if you want to, Ephesians 4, if you just want some more bad news. But, 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 but here it is, is that God goes on our hearts, says, y'all, I'm giving you the real story. Why? Can, can, can I tell you Why? Because if you need a quadruple bypass, you don't want somebody to operate on one vessel. Y'all must be asleep. If you need a quadruple bypass, you don't want a dude to go in there and get one. You want him to go get the whole. God just came and said, your heart is so infested with sin that I've got to come in there and open it up. And when I open up that thing, I allow you to respond to the good news. When Lydia responds to the good news, she and her whole household got baptized. And then she says, Paul, stay with us. Keep teaching us the word. Let me give you the final piece of good news. Walk with me to Luke. Give me the next slide. Luke 24, verse 32. On Wednesday nights, we have what we call our Bible study called the Emmaus Experience. The Emmaus Experience comes from the story of Jesus walking with the two men on the road to Emmaus from Luke 24, 13 through 32. Jesus sees two men after, watch this, his resurrection. And the men are concentrating on his crucifixion. He died, and we were hoping that he would be the one to save us. You, didn't miss, you, you missed it. They're concentrating on the crucifixion, but he's been raised. And his message throughout all the New Testament and the Gospels is not that Jesus died. It was that I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be raised on the third day. That's why the good news is not the death of Christ. The good news is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Even better news is the ascension of Christ. Even greater news is he's coming back. But these dudes are concentrating on the crucifixion, 
And Jesus comes by and starts talking to him. And he says, oh, men, slow of heart and not able to understand these things. And Jesus begins to walk with him. And the Bible says, in beginning with Moses and the prophets, he begins to explain to them everything in the Bible concerning himself. Y'all, listen to me very carefully. Some folks say that the Sermon on the Mount was the greatest sermon ever preached. Some folks say that. I'm good with that. I ain't got no problem with it. Some folks say, man, the Olivet Discourse. Some folks say the Upper Room Discourse because there are a lot of good sermons that Jesus preaches. Y'all, but the most Christological sermon ever preached was not preached to 5,000 on a hill. It was preached to two cats. Jesus Christ took his greatest, most Christological sermon and started with Genesis chapter 1 and explained from Moses through the prophets everything in the scriptures while we're on this 7 to 13 mile walk concerning himself. Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying, now look here man, when, when Moses, uh, excuse me, when, when Abraham and the 318 trained men went and got Lot and Lot was, you know, caught up in captivity, uh, if you recognize that 3 plus 1 plus 8 is 12 and Y'all were in captivity, and I came to set the captives free, Luke 4, that was me. Y'all didn't get it? Y'all didn't get it? Okay, here's the, here's the deal. Do you realize that when Noah was there and the other seven folk that got on the boat, the Bible never spoke about their righteousness. It spoke about Noah's righteousness. And so they got on the boat and got saved because of Noah's righteousness. Can, can, I, can I tell y'all? That, that was me. But, but, but watch this. Not only was Noah's the righteousness that got them on the boat, but what protected them from the wrath outside was the ark. That was me. And Jesus began to walk through all of the Old Testament and explain to them the things concerning himself. Yeah, yeah. That's good news right there. And as he began to explain those things, watch what the Bible says in Luke 24, verse 32. They sat down and they ate together, had a meal. He opened up the meal, broke the bread, and then all of a sudden they saw him. When he broke the bread, check out verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us the, on the road and explaining to the scriptures to us? Y'all. Here's how you know you got a good heart. You know you got a good heart when the word of God is being taught and your heart burns. You want to know, you, you know how you had surgery? You know that when the scriptures are being taught and you rock a little bit. Now, I know that there's some intellectual folk and you don't rock and move, but when the scriptures are being taught and, and, and you want to jump a little bit, the scripture be telling you, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now you don't, you don't, because you, you ain't holy enough to say it out loud yet because you got a quiet personality, but on the inside, you, oh, yeah, 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 yeah that, that's it right there, that's it. Now, I ain't going to run like Sister Jackie, I, I ain't going to run, but, but, but I like that, what he's saying right there. When, when you know that the scriptures are being taught and your heart is burning, Doc, you got a good heart. That means that God has performed heart surgery on you and has totally changed you so that you can now respond to the scriptures. If your heart doesn't jump and delight when the scripture being taught, you might not know it. You might not have had the surgery. But when your heart begins to look at the scriptures and see God in the scriptures, it's an amazing thing. Every week, here's what I pray. Generally, Lord, open our minds that we might see wonderful things in the law. Psalm 119, verse 18. You know what the psalmist is saying? Although I'm writing the scriptures, if you don't open my eyes, I won't see the beautiful things that are in the word of God. The psalmist is saying, although I'm writing the scriptures, I'm dependent on God to appreciate what's in the scriptures. Then the Bible says, and he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In other words, it takes God to not only open your heart to respond to the gospel, but it also takes God to open your mind to understand the scriptures. Whenever you hear the scriptures being taught and you can understand the meaning behind the scriptures, you ought to raise your hand and bless God. Why? Because you've had a heart transplant. You no longer live 
in the condition that was just described for 45 minutes. But with all that being said, here's what God tells us. Guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the course of your life. Right now, tonight, the number one thing that you want to change tonight as a result of this lesson is not anything that anybody did to you. What you want to change tonight is the way you watch your heart. Observe your innermost being. And when you are able to biblically tell that it's going off, let it reel you back in. Take every thought captive to the knowledge and the obedience of Jesus Christ. The first thing that God does is when he saves us, he begins to operate on us, gives us the mind of Christ, gives us this new heart to understand the gospel, gives us this new heart to bleed and, and to delight when the word of God is being taught. And as a result, the total motivations of our heart change in why we do what we do. We no longer do what we do to please man. We now do what we do to glorify God. We do what we do for man because we love God and we love man. Because God has changed our motivations. I'm not doing what I'm doing trying to get in with somebody, to get favor with somebody. I'm doing what I'm doing because God has so changed me, and I realized I was lying on a table. Y'all, imagine yourself after I just read for 45 minutes. You're lying on the table, dead, and God came by and opened your heart and allowed you to respond to the gospel.